Go, Charlo. Go, Charlo. Go, Charlo. Ha! Ho! 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 Just what's the best way to grab on to the last blast of winter in the far north? Do it by dog team. The traditional Inuit sled dog is the toughest of all the dog sled breeds. Up here, they call it the Labrador Husky. Running sled dogs is not all about hopping on for an easy ride. These dogs are hardcore and hard work. The dogs can be difficult to handle at the best of times. They may seem happy and friendly, and towards humans they are, but turn your back on them for one second and they can start a dog fight that will convince you they are only one evolutionary step away from being a ravenous pack of wolves. For my survival odyssey this time, I'm taking my dog team into the rugged land known as Labrador. Scrub forest, craggy mountains, and deep ocean fjords make up Labrador's vast 113,000 square miles. All of Great Britain can fit into this barren land. The average yearly temperatures in Labrador are below freezing. From here, there is nothing but empty land all the way to the Arctic. My safety crew and I first travel in more than five hours by snowmobile. They'll spend a week camped in the bush while I dog sled further up the coast into the barrens. Even though I'll have no contact with them, they are my only link to help. All right. You gentlemen all good? All good to go, man. Stay safe. Yeah! Ho, ho, ho! Woo! See you in seven days! For the next week, it'll be just me, my cameras, and the dogs. There are a few places on this planet where the name alone will conjure up an image of challenge and survival. And Labrador is one of those places. It's late winter up here now. The nights are still cold and dangerously damp. And the days are getting long. They offer up a mixed bag of weather. It can be sunny and pleasant one day and have a brutal storm the next. Snowmobiles are still the main mode of travel up here now, but dog sledding is still alive and well. For the next seven days, I'll travel through the subarctic forests of Labrador until I meet up with my crew. I'll film it all myself, and except for my dogs, I'll be completely alone. I've only been able to spend the last two days getting to know these dogs, and they won't want to perform for me until they respect me. They're only used to their owner's voice, and unless they know I mean business, they won't listen to their commands. It's an aggressive activity. I have no more trouble from them. I can slowly let myself cool down, dry the sweat. Whoa! G! 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 That's it! That's it! Good, Bob! Good, Bob. It would be simple enough to use right and left, but dog mushers still prefer to stick to G for right and ha for left as commands. Ha! Ha! No! No! Ha! Ha! No! That's what it's like, trying to run dogs. It can be tough, really tough. Oh, now I'm sweating. Almost lost the sled there. That would have been a bad way to start off the week. When they took off on me like that, I jumped on, and for a while there, they were dragging me. My hands were grabbed on, but my legs were behind the sled sliding in the snow. Go on now, go on now. Hey, G, 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 C, N, G, Chido. Wow, you can see this. Go on, G. My team is made up of both male and female dogs, but the females typically make better leaders. For my pair up front, there is Shiloh and her daughter, C, N. 
Behind them, the slightly neurotic Gus, who needs to travel alone, followed by the up-and-coming male, Chance, beside the timid female, Hiluk. As the wheel dogs, which is the position closest to the sled, we have the two big brothers, Jack and Guluk, to round out the team. Put up with about 15, 20 minutes of getting the chills, cold wind on me, but at least now it's dried all my sweat. And uh, put some warm clothes on, it won't be much to get warm again. But when you're soaking wet with sweat, very, very dangerous. That's how people die. I think I'm gonna pull you over, girls. I think we're gonna go right in there for the night. I've been traveling all day now, and I've got to get in close to the bush and out of the wind, but the dogs are confused. Okay. They think I want to return, so they keep heading me back the way we came. I could easily fall off the sled at a time like this and lose them. It's a very dangerous situation. If I can't get them in close to the bush and on their night chain, the possibility of a dog fight becomes way too strong. Shiloh is insisting on going back home and keeping her straight is exhausting work. Then the worst happens. The only way to stop one of these dog fights is to become as angry and as tough, and in fact, tougher than the dogs themselves. If I don't, they may rip apart each other into a bloody mess and in some cases have even killed their own. No musher can afford to let that happen, and my soft rubber boots amount to a slap on the wrist for these extremely tough dogs. Now that the worst is over, I'm drenched with sweat at the most dangerous time of the day. Every effort must be made to dry my body out so that I don't attempt to sleep on top of eight feet of snow with a damp chill running down my spine. I'd be hypothermic within minutes. This happens when my body core temperature drops below 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and my natural and normal body functions like shivering are unable to bring it back up. Simply put, hypothermia can kill you, sometimes in less than a day. Working out here without a shirt off. It's not so I can look tough in the winter cold because trying to get these guys hooked up took everything I had and I was just pouring with sweat. And it's, uh, it's getting late in the day. So I'm just trying to dry my body off, cool down and dry all the sweat off before I have to put some more clothes back on and try to stay warm for the night. This is old butcher's throwaway meat, fit for the dogs, but not for me. This whole first day seemed like such a rush hooking up the dogs, yelling at them constantly to either keep going or to take the right trail, stopping them from ripping each other apart in dog fights. The activity of running dogs has extremely high highs, but also very low lows. Keep quiet. It's emotionally draining and physically exhausting. I still have to consider my situation and think about how I'm going to get food in this barren land wilderness. Well, I'm in it now, the middle of Labrador, during what is probably one of the most dangerous seasons, a period of time at the end of winter, the beginning of spring, when just about anything could happen weather-wise. So, got to look at my priorities. First, my immediate priorities. Get out of the wind, which I've done enough, I think, I hope, for the night. The 24-hour priorities are to take a look at everything that I have, and I'm set up pretty well with what I need for dog sledding, which is quite a bit of equipment, and figure out what I can do with what I've got in terms of survival. And then I have my seven day set of priorities. My goal is to follow the edge of the fjord out and find a trail to the interior. From there, I'll need to circle back to the safety camp. It's many miles and I'll have seven days to do it. I wasn't gonna do this, I was just gonna sleep on the sled, but the wind's cutting across the lake, so I'm gonna come closer into the bush here and sleep with the dogs, I guess. Tonight, the wind is picking up on the ocean, so sleeping in the sled, although it would be comfortable, is not an option. I figure on making a simple bow bed. That ought to do. Just something to get me up here and out of the wind. Hey. Come here. Come here. After a full day of running dogs and dealing with fights and wrong turns on the trail, I'm exhausted. 
I'm hoping I can do without a fire for the night. This time I have the luxury of an old sleeping bag and an axe to get me through this week. It could be an awful mistake not making a shelter, but sometimes the lack of energy can dictate just how much I can accomplish. Then it comes down to hoping that Mother Nature is kind and gives me just this one break. Well, you can see obviously one of my survival items is an axe. There's two reasons for that. Number one, is that no self-respecting dog sledder would ever go out in the bush without an axe. Number two, is that whether I'm making a Survivor Man show or not, you won't find me out in the Canadian North in the winter without an axe. Not a chance. I'm gonna try something different this time. I'm gonna survive with an actual survival kit. I'll show you what's in this tomorrow when daylight hits. Well, there's one dog up just looking at me. The rest of the dogs are all curled up in little balls in that classic sled dog style. Stars are starting to come out, which is a good sign. Most of the sky is overcast. I'm really hoping it's not going to rain tonight since I'm exposed here just sort of laying out on this bed of boughs. It's below freezing. Hopefully this sleeping bag will keep me warm. Night number one in Labrador. It's been nearly 24 hours of eating snow. A pot of hot water now will do the trick to lift my spirits and give me some warmth and energy, since there will be no food going into my stomach this morning. It's morning, and I'm having a hard time pulling myself out of this sleeping bag. The wind is uh, moving, moving a bit this morning, making it pretty cool. If I build the fire right on top of the snow, I can keep it burning and get it to burn, but it'll end up just dropping down. I mean, I'm up above about eight feet of snow here, and be a mighty deep hole by the time the fire started burning down. So I'm just going to build myself a little rotted wood platform here. Just some petroleum jelly. Now I have this here because of the dogs. Put it on the dog's feet to protect them. Especially when the uh, snow gets crunchy and icy like this, it can cut their feet and hurt them. Also helps keep them a little bit warmer. And in a little mini first aid kit, some cotton balls. Petroleum jelly. Taken and mixed in with the cotton. Take a flint sparker here. See that? Cotton takes the flame real well and holds it. Birch bark comes in. And I've got myself a very fast fire. And I put a bunch of snow into this coffee tin. This coffee tin is actually part of the survival kit. You'll find out why when I get into it. That's nice. Oh, yeah, that's well worth it. Labrador is one of the most raw and unforgiving landscapes I've seen. Its rocky mountains are dotted with icy lakes, marshes, and cut by long fjords, an obstacle course of water. At this time of year, it can go from bone-chilling cold one minute to a warmth that will turn everything to slush the next. From the very first time I began surviving in remote areas and sharing it on film, I've been asked to do it with a fully stocked survival kit to show how it can help or to show how tough it still can be, even with the advantages. You've already seen me use an ax. In addition to that, I brought along just a simple 22 rifle. It's also a survival kit in itself, and I'll show more on that later. I use the coffee tin to boil water in, and I find the coffee tins work great. One thing, it's got a plastic lid to it. So now I've got it full of water, put my lid on top, and I can carry water with me. This is quite a robust pack of fishing supplies. Space blanket, orange garbage bag. Rope is always killer in survival. Something that's always been key to me personally when I'm out in the wilderness for survival is a saw. I've made the survival kit up myself from scratch, and it of course wouldn't be complete without fire starting implements. With it, 
I'll make my way across this harsh landscape searching for good survival locations, places to fish or catch game animals. The dogs will do the legwork, and so the food stays with them. But all eight of us will have to deal with whatever weather comes at us. And this morning, it's already threatening to make travel and survival tough. All right, it's decision time. I was planning on sticking to the lake and traveling along the shoreline. But as you can see, a whiteout has moved in. I can't see a thing now. Can't see the other shore. I can see this shore and that's it. But if the dogs go out too far and I have to fight with them to keep them close to the shore, that could be tricky. I've decided to trust my senses and try to follow the shore during this whiteout. I can just make out the shoreline through the snow when the dogs get out too far. But the truth is, I don't think the dogs like the idea of being out in a blizzard any more than I do. One of the most dangerous times for running these dogs is getting them to jump across cracks in the sea ice or through slush. If the leader is timid about it, she may stop on me all of a sudden, causing a traffic jam and bunching the dogs all together in a tangled line of jaw-snapping, fur-flying, bloody mess. That's it, girls. Good boy, Gus. That's it, Chance. That's it. Good girl, he look. Good boy, Chance. Chance, look ahead. Look ahead. Up, Chance. By far, the greatest danger is falling off the sled or losing the dog team. If I let go for a second, this pack will be long gone and I will be completely stranded. There's no way I could catch up to a dog team in full run. I gotta get off this lake, guys. I'm freezing out here. Take me somewhere into the trees, we can get warm. Good girls, good girls. That's it, that's it. After a full day of overheating and even sweating on the inside of my clothes while my fingers and toes deal with frostbite, I finally make it to the bush trail. My chance to get out of the wind and off the ocean ice. I think we found our trail. Go on, boys. That's it, Gluck. That's it, Jack. Good boys. That's it, that's it. Don't mind the slush, girls. Don't mind the slush. These Labrador bush trails go for miles and miles through the frozen subarctic, and many people have perished on, out here. Recently, the government began constructing small survival cabins spaced out along the trail for emergencies. And this time, I'm the lucky survivalist about to take advantage of a cabin they had built on this trail only a month ago. The skies have a strange look to them and I'm betting the weather will continue to change constantly while I travel. Good pups, they all good. Well, if this cabin was built for people who need to survive, I figure I qualify. I've been two full exhausting days without an ounce of food, woke up to a blizzard, yelled at, ran after, and looked after a team of dogs, not to mention breaking up dog fights constantly. And the weather coming in doesn't look all that promising. So for now, I am without food or fresh water, but at least I can escape the elements for a night. I can't take the food from the dogs. They need that food to pull me. Now, in times of survival, it's happened. Guys will start to ration the dogs down, eat some of the dog food. And Robert Perry on the way to the pool, he had it timed out so that all of the dogs would carry their own weighted food. Once they uh, got down through the dog food, then he would start killing off the dogs one by one and feeding one dog to the rest of the dogs. Kind of a brutal way to go, but it is survival. When I first went out hunting, the snow was as hard as pavement, so I left my snowshoes behind. But as the day warms up, the snow gets punchier. And now I'm many miles from my cabin. Making snowshoes out of the bush will get me back to safety without exhausting myself trying to walk on top of eight feet of punchy snow. Oh, we got a few items here. All right. Got a meal. Ah. Reindeer moss. 
Labrador tea. Well, I do see some little squirrel piles and things. I could probably set snares by if I stay here another night. I'm not seeing any uh, ptarmigan or snowshoe hare trails. I'll leave the gray jay alone for now. But uh, if he sticks around with me for the week, he better be careful come around day five, day four. At that point, I will lose my sentimentality. I'll be thinking about a Grey Jay dinner. The hills of Labrador. That's a cold biting wind. I didn't find any ptarmigan or grouse, or snowshoe here, but I didn't find this old tin though. And this will come in handy later. The only sign that anyone had been here since the cabin was built was a small bottle of hand sanitizer of all things, but even this has a surprising use. It's also a fire starter. It only stands to reason that creams and liquids with enough alcohol in them might be flammable enough to catch a spark, a good thing to know when I'm down on matches. All right, some simple hand sanitizer and a spark, and we've got fire. Both the Labrador tea and the reindeer moss have the double advantage of giving me various vitamins or starches, and also simply lifting my spirits and making me feel somewhat human again. Nothing does that when you're hungry and cold like a flavorful hot drink. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, there's nothing like hot water. Hmm. Still hot. There's my reindeer moss. Hmm. Nothing special. Kind of bland. But starch and nutrients. Simple wild edibles have been the savior of many a lost victim. But now I want to see what I can make out of that old fuel can. I'm trying to make a little stove for my travels. I can bring in a source of heat right into just about any shelter without burning it down, and the confined metal space of the can will help to keep hot coals longer so I can use small sticks to keep myself warm. I've got myself a portable little wood stove. I've got my hobo stove. I need to play a hobo song. <laughs> I may be sheltered from any bad weather that comes in thanks to the survival cabin, but I have no food. So it's time to do a local patrol to see what kind of game animal activity I can find in the frozen bush. When the snow is hard crusted, I can walk on it forever. The downside is that no animal leaves a trail. They can walk on it too. And the usually easily snared snowshoe hare runs across this hard packed snow without leaving a single mark. You know, they say in Labrador, you can go through all four seasons in one day. I'm beginning to believe it. I still think that your best survival kit is what you can have in your pockets. But if you hunt, your rifle can be a survival kit as well. It looks like an ordinary rifle, but let me show you. Take the butt end off. All I did was take a drill and drill out some holes in the stock itself. If you want, you could drill out a few holes and actually kind of gouge it out until you have more of a compartment. I've just got a few holes. Okay. And in there, got some extra bullets. I'm able to fit about 10 extra bullets in these holes, which are good because you don't want to run out of bullets. The other thing I have in there, from a Q-tip, some cotton tinder, and then as well, a little fire striker. And uh, you've got a little survival kit built right into the butt of the gun. It's a good thing you know. I've been out walking on the hard crusted snow for hours. And I haven't seen a sign of a single ptarmigan or 
snowshoe hare, or anything. I know they're out here, but I've been walking for hours and I haven't seen any signs at all. So it just shows you. I might have a cabin to keep me out of the elements at night, but survival up here is tough. This time of year, it's real tough. The weather is holding out with blue sky and sunshine so far after dealing with that first blizzardy morning and the snow has a hard crust until late in the day thanks to a cold cutting wind making travel easy. But whatever the weather, the dogs have food and I don't. And I'm getting hungry. Is that Gray Jay back again? I'll call him dinner before this week's up. Hi guys, hey, how's it going? Okay, I'm going fishing, guys. Wish me luck. It's day three of my survival odyssey in Labrador. As tempting as it is to eat the dog food, the dogs themselves need it for survival. They burn a lot of calories pulling the heavy-laden sled. I'm still not that far from the ocean since the trail paralleled the shoreline, and I know the Innu people who survive up here fish the seal holes along with making their own holes in the ice. I passed a number of them when the dogs and I traveled the ocean ice in the blizzard. This is where a small, simple fishing kit comes in handy for survival. You can see a lot of old skidoo tracks from the Inuit hunters. People traveling these lands, fishing and hunting, hunting for seal usually. I really wouldn't want to fall through the ice out here now, would I? That would be trouble. But I'm guessing it's pretty safe this time of year. Of course, on the other hand, I punched through the ice on the way out here. This is what happens when you're tired. I'm out here, I'm out at the seal holes, the fishing holes. I forgot my axe. Oh. So I'll see if I can punch through. Oh man, that was stupid. These holes are often covered over by branches or marked with poles, so they're easy to spot when the people travel through this region. That'll do. Yeah, that was easy. I didn't even have to carry my axe all the way down here, bonus. Just some sinkers, hook, and line. Easily carried in a small packet. Small survival kit in your pockets. I'm just gonna put on a bit of dog food for bait, because that's what I have. Here's my hole. There it goes. I've tried using the tiny scraps of dog food as bait. I've even tried using some of the lures in the kit. Well, I'm gonna try for about two hours. When you're fishing from a small hole in the ice, there's no real trick to it. I'm still trying. Here, fishy, 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 fishy. Either you're lucky and the fish are near, or they're not. Oh, are you there? Felt you. Well, I thought I had a couple of bites there for a minute, but nothing. Fishing is not exactly a spectator sport. Well, the sun's going down, as you can see. No luck, no fish and no game while I was out hunting. That's the way it goes, you know. I mean, you go out hunting, you go out fishing just to, when you're just relaxing, you're camping or cottaging, and not see a thing. No different here. It's just that when you're trying to survive, it's a little more heartbreaking. I'm gonna do this. I said I wouldn't do it. But I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna steal some food from the docks. That's my boy. Well, truthfully, I never thought I'd see the day I'd be doing this. Stealing food from a dog. Oh, man. Uh, I was gonna just take a whole rib, but uh, there's dog poop on the other side. <laughs> so I'm not going to touch that other side. I have no way of knowing how old this food is, how good it is. 
It was reserved for the dogs, after all. Hey! The grossest part of this was that the dogs have dragged this meat through their own feces, something I'll have to get past if I'm to put some food energy into my system. So, I'm going to take my dog food, cut her up, put her in, going into my pot. It's there, it looks good. I'm gonna boil it up, quite a bit actually. Boil the heck out of it. Hopefully kill any germs. Get that dog hair out of there. The headlamp was in the survival kit, another huge advantage for surviving, especially if I have to travel or if I get injured during the night. Let's see how that boils up. One of the best ways to stay warm at night is to eat just before I bed down. The process of digestion heats up my body while I sleep. Oh, that's still hot, but that's good. So it's all the caribou broth now. Mmm, that's gotta be good for me. I hope that the meat's okay. No, in truth, we can eat a lot more than we give ourselves credit for, and that includes sometimes rotten meat. I know that sounds kind of gross and disgusting, but our stomachs aren't as weak as we think they are. Now, the problem with getting tainted meat and bad meat is when you get stuff that's store-bought. Sits on a shelf, goes in a truck, travels the country, sits on another shelf. That's when you run into all of your poisons and meat and problems and stuff like that, but we can eat a lot of meat, actually, raw. And we used to. We just got away from it. You know, there are stories of people who've taken their mukluks and cut them apart and boiled them up and eaten that. Those mukluks are made out of moose hide or caribou hide or seal skin. So I don't feel so bad. Mmm. So, there you have it. Stolen dog food stew. Mmm. Mm. I have no choice now. If I'm to try to make it back to the safety camp, I've got to leave the relative comfort of this cabin and keep moving. Not looking forward to this. I can't afford to wait any longer. I've got a lot of ground to cover. Easy. All I can do now is hope for the best when it comes to this weather. This is the most unstable time of year for weather patterns. One day sunny, and the next it's a blizzard, or worse, freezing rain. Holy mackerel. That's it. That's it. All right, all right. Woo! You got me sweating, girls. Not a good day to get me sweating, boys and girls. OK. Go on, go on. Oh yeah, out of girls. Right up the hill, way to go. That's the worst part of the day, guys, hooking you up. Worst part of the day. I know you're happy, but I'm sweating. That is a cold wind out here. Go on, girls, ho, ho, ho. So I've got a couple of things to concern myself with here. One is how wet I got while I was hooking up the dogs. I got pretty sweaty, so I kept my jacket open to dry the sweat on my back throughout my body, but it makes me pretty cold and chilled. Number two, once I stop in a few hours, I gotta worry about shelter. These are the barren lands now. Well, at least they call these the barrens. It's sparse bush, but it's uh, cold and windy here. That's it, guys. Let's find someplace sheltered. Let's get out of here. All right. I'm at the ocean again. That's gonna be cold. I'll have to travel it for a bit, but then I'm gonna have to tuck in somewhere protected for sure. 
I was traveling for a while even with the fly of my pants undone so I could get some air circulating all through my body to dry off the sweat. It's chilly when you to do that, but better to get dry. Open water, guys. Open water. I can do without the open water, girls. There are no other survival cabins for me to take advantage of, and I don't want to spend the night exposed out on the ocean ice. So I'm keeping my eyes open for any kind of gully or closed in area where I can build a small shelter and get out of the wind. The dogs are remaining aggressive with each other, and I have to watch ahead constantly to make sure they don't take wrong trails. One small mistake when running a dog team can lead to a major disaster. All right, keep the jacket open, try to let some of this sweat dry in the cool weather. I'm gonna try something a little crazy here. I've emptied stuff out of my sled. And I'm just gonna simulate what actually happens. Okay guys, you're on your own. That's easily how it happens. There isn't a dog sledder out there who hasn't found himself lost without the dogs. Doesn't put down the snow hook properly. Dogs take off. There's even stories of the dogs going as far as 100 miles back to town, leaving the musher stranded out there. And that's my case now. All right, there's my stuff. To add to my problems, mild, wet, and windy weather is coming in on me quickly. Huh. Whoa, snow's getting soft. Well, I've come to this spot. It's a lot more protected than where I was when I let the dogs go. Dogs will be fine. They're gonna follow the trail out. As for me, I've got about six hours of daylight left, and by the looks of the sky, I should expect some bad weather. So I can't just sit out by the fire tonight. I'm gonna have to make some kind of a shelter. This is the worst time of year. Rain, freezing rain during the day, cold at night. It's a real bad time for hypothermia. Yeah, I guess here we'll have to do. I'm just gonna create a snow trench, and I think that will suffice. Maybe even keep me warm. It's so vitally important that I don't let myself sweat now. Extremely important. You sweat, you die. Maybe only just another couple of feet here. Two feet and I'm done. They call it a snow trench, but it's a lot like making a coffin. Yeah, that'll do. Warmer temperatures during the day is nice, but it also makes survival harder. Everything becomes wet and heavy. I begin to punch through the snow when I walk. Moving. I think I'm gonna get rained on. The dampness begins to seep into my bones. And this is the worst time of year for hypothermia. Orange garbage bag, thermal blanket. So that's home for tonight. Oh, okay, that was easy. There we go. <clears throat> well, no one ever said survival was rocket science. Great thing about this spot is there's a brook running underneath here. Unfortunately, I keep falling into it, but at least this way I can get fresh water 
As long as the tide's not in and it's sprackish, I'm gonna have to find out right now. Nope, that's good fresh water. That's great. I don't even have to uh, melt any snow. Hmm. Okay, since I totally blew it with the cameras and forgot to press record while I was lighting that fire, let me just show you exactly what I did so you can see what I mean and why this stuff is great fire starter. Take this little guy here. Set it up like that. Put it down on your, on your wood. Take the rest of it and just roll it up. Save it for later. Shoot a spark into it. Now you'll see. Just like that. It's great. It's like having a candle lit. And you roll it up in a little ball, keep it in your pocket, and you've got good fire starter with just a spark. Now I'm going to go back and make some tea. All right. Got my water on to boil. And there's still some leftover caribou fat that had solidified and was on the insides of the pot. That's great. It's going to make it a bit of a broth for me. But this time I'm going to add in some spruce. And as well, I'm going to throw in some willow. Willow is actually also good if you've got a headache too. Slowing down whenever I can helps to conserve my energy, but it also gives my body a chance to cool down too. So refueling with hot bush tea will make a big difference. Mm. This has got some residual caribou broth in it, spruce needles and willow twigs. And it's, uh, it's helpful and it makes me feel fantastic. <laughs> That's all I can say. I should put some boughs over top of my shelter in case it snows. <laughs> Time to crawl into the shelter. Sleeping in this kind of claustrophobic shelter is near torture. You have to contort your body and move like some kind of bound up caterpillar, all the while with your face only an inch from the snow wall. And the lack of oxygen is frustrating and leads to small moments of panic. Ah, I got my sleeping bag backwards. Okay. So here I am in my little snow trench. With any luck at all, I won't wake up shivering. And I'll be fine in here for the night. I didn't make it long enough though. My feet are kind of sticking out the end. Put an orange garbage bag over top of them. Ugh. Oh boy. This has been a long night in this claustrophobic little shelter. Stayed dry in here. Sort of. I mean, damp beyond belief, but not getting rained on. Oh, man. The lens is all fogging up. It's so damp in here. Crawling out of the shelter backwards into the freezing rain is maddening. So I'm going to try to expand the shelter to see if I can get more than an hour combined sleep during the night. Constantly improving my shelter and my surroundings increases my chances of survival. Even just physiologically, I feel like I am always improving getting somewhere. I feel better about myself, and my odds of surviving. This is the weather that kills hypothermia at this time of year. It's the most dangerous thing that you have to deal with. It's starting to rain harder. And did I mention that it's kind of like freezing rain since it's late winter? I gotta, I gotta fix this stupid shelter. I need more room. So I'm going to put up a bit of a structure in the front here, give myself some more room. And if I can do that, maybe I can even set it so that I can have a fire inside. Wouldn't that be novel? This is the perfect situation, finally, for using my hobo stove. I can bring heat inside with me without burning down my small shelter. It'll help to keep the damp chill out. 
Stop raining. After working on this shelter all day, I get the biggest surprise yet of any survival ordeal I've gone through. All this freezing rain and warm weather has devastated the sea ice. One of the crew attempted the long trek back to the small ocean village and nearly lost his life going through the ocean slush that up here they call slob. The usual five hour trek took him twice that, avoiding increasing dangers all the way. The safety crew have themselves become stranded from civilization by miles and miles of six feet deep slush and water on top of ocean ice. I am a further hour into the bush from the safety camp, but they risk the trek to give me the news. The deteriorating conditions mean that I will be stranded as well. We only have one chance to get me back to safety camp for evacuation before the distance between them and I becomes impassable by slush. Apprise me of the situation. Are they slushy or what's uh, the deal? Yeah, we had to skull all the way around inside the tornado. Couldn't get as rain we have here now. You're going to have at least, you know, maybe six, eight feet slush, which is going to make that ice heavy. You don't think we'll get across? For example, that little river there this morning, you know, that's, that's wide open this morning. We had to we'll go all the way around it. And as it's compressing, it's pushing it down and driving the water up on top. Too. Nearly losing the sleds and the slush ourselves on the way back, we finally made it into the safety camp. And with the ocean gone to slush between here and the small northern village, the only way to rescue the entire crew and myself was by helicopter. Well, here he comes. Can't believe we all have to be choppered out of here, but that's the nature of shooting a Survivor Man show. We take our chances. We're way out in the middle of Labrador here, and what's happened is the ocean and all the rain, all the waters come up, and it's just slush between here and a four and a half hour drive on snow machine back to safety, back to town. We can't make it, we can't get back. We're stuck out here. We got a helicopter, everybody, all the machines, everything out of here. And that's why they had to come and get me too. So that's it. Well, I may have survived Labrador, and my safety crew, they were doing all right, but the weather here has decided differently for us. It effectively stranded me from my safety crew and my safety crew from civilization. I was a full hour beyond my production team into the Labrador wilderness, but I have to hand it to the crew. To pull off filmmaking like this, even they have to take their chances. It's a tough job for all of us, but that's what it takes when it comes to real survival. <laughs> 